Welcome to CDE Virtual, everybody, and to the Governor. I'm, I'm going to ask Lori Dippenau, former Chairman of CDE and one of the founders of the First Strand Group, to open our events today. Lori, over to you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we are hosting the 12th event in our series celebrating what is now more than 25 years since CDE's launch in 1995. I've personally attended nine of these events, and I'm sure that many of you here tonight will have done the same. The speakers are of exceptional quality, and the topics are highly relevant in today's turbulent and challenging times. I recently retired as chairman of CDE after 14 years. The fact that I stayed on for 14 years is testimony to the respect I have for CDE and the work it is doing. I'm now an observer rather than an insider, but I still find the contribution that CDE make trying to find solutions to South Africa's very severe challenges arising from low levels of economic growth and high levels of unemployment absolutely vital. One of the strategies to maximize CDE's impact is to complement the work of like-minded people and organizations who are also dedicated to helping the country's economy grow. So the South African Reserve Bank is one of the most important institutions in South Africa. The Reserve Bank is testimony to the fact that this country can build and maintain organizations of excellence and real integrity. Now that I'm no longer a banker, I can compliment the Reserve Bank and Governor Khan uh, Yako as its leader for the vital role they play in our economy and the way it, and in a way it is world class. Well, it is definitely world class. Now all the banks work closely with the South African Reserve Bank almost on a daily basis. And I therefore have first hand knowledge and experience of dealing with this truly excellent institution led by the governor. Lastly, I would like to point out that South African Reserve Bank's independence shields it from undue political pressure. It is therefore vitally important that this independence should be protected at all costs. I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation and will now hand over to Anne, who will formally introduce the governor and start the interview. Thanks very much, Laurie. It's my privilege to welcome the governor of South Africa's Reserve Bank to CDE. He is currently serving a second term since his appointment in 2014. He was deputy governor between 2011 and 2014 and director general of the National Treasury prior to that. Until recently, he chaired the International Monetary and Financial Committee, the primary advisory board to the IMF Board of Governors. In 2019, I was nearly run over by the governor's car. He had been invited to give a prestigious lecture at the Peterson Institute in Washington, DC. And I happened to be there at the time and wanted to hear him speak and to, su to support one of democratic South Africa's most impressive civil servants at, at what is the world's leading economic think tank. Governor, it's a great privilege to have you here. Welcome. Um, if you want to say any few words before we start with, the, with my interrogation. I think that we should start. It is uh, good to be at CGE. I've been uh, following uh, 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 the work that you have been doing and the uh, uh, interventions in the uh, public discourse. Um, and uh, I would like to keep this uh, open. Let us have a conversation. I deliberately decided not to have a speech um, uh, because I wanted us to have a, a conversation. So uh, uh, let's hit it. Great, great. So how does a rural boy get to be governor of the Reserve Bank? What were the key influences, mentors and steps along the way to this important position? in your life? I never thought that growing up that I would be a governor of a reserve bank, uh, let alone thinking that I would be an economist. I had studied sciences at uh, 
high school and that is what I thought I was going uh, I was going to do and um, uh, and I got in into a uh, university and I got attracted and I thought that they said that they are looking for people who uh, could be CAs and I thought oh that's do I need, I need accounting and it turns out no you needed math and English and um, but then uh, when I registered for my BCom degree I decided that I love economics and I would like to pursue economics. In the end, I decided I'm not becoming a CA. I'm going to major in both uh, accounting and, uh, and economics. And interestingly was that in um, uh, 1987, 1988, um, the, the ANC released uh, constitutional guidelines for a democratic uh, 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 South Africa. And uh, some among the student activists, there was a call that said that uh, somebody must lead us into this thing. And I had a friend of mine who said, uh, uh, we are going to need people like you. At the time, as students, uh, the, art, the students in the arts and in law faculty were the most articulate in student meetings. And one felt like that is where one should go. And this friend of mine said that, no, you are not going there, you are sticking where you are and I said, what a cheek. And he said, you do not seem to understand. One day we are going to run this country and we are going to need people with the skills in this, uh, uh, in this field. And so I developed then the passion for analyzing economies and what makes other economies thrive and others to, uh, to fail. And, um, but uh, my first job was uh, in banking, it's interesting that you brought a uh, lorry and it was actually with uh, Butler's Bank a few months before it became First National, uh, First National Bank. And, uh, and I worked as a banking clerk. Um, uh, one day I got a call to assist Kosatu with uh, its accounting system and I worked for uh, Kosatu, worked as an accountant for Kosatu and at the ANC and Eventually, there was a view that said that we needed a lot of people to shape economic policy of a post-apartheid South Africa. And that's how I then got deeper uh, into, into economics. But even then, I didn't think that I will end up being a governor of a central bank. I was not even looking at that. And even after I joined the uh, Reserve Bank, which was in 1994, uh, I worked as an investment manager, as a foreign exchange uh, trader in the Reserve Bank. And eventually I felt that I wanted to shape policy. And I felt that the place to shape policy would be in the national treasury. And I thought I would be in the national treasury for um, two years, three years, and come back to the Reserve Bank where I stayed in the national treasury for 15 and a half years. And uh, when the call came, that I must become the deputy governor of the Reserve Bank. I was sort of like uh, taken aback because that is not where I was seeing uh, myself. At the time, I even thought that maybe one could try your luck in the, uh, in the uh, private sector. Cut a long story short, the journey that one walked shows that uh, even someone growing up in a rural area, and my, this has been my message to rural kids, that the People who I saw succeed out of the villages had one thing in common. They took advantage of the opportunities offered by education. And so even as a nation, if we are to invest in the future of this nation, we have got to invest in the education of our young people. I couldn't agree more. Um, let's turn to the bank and jobs and growth. The central mandate of the Saab is to manage inflation. You once said that there is a deep-seated misunderstanding in South Africa that there's some trade-off between growth and inflation. You've also said that like other inflation-targeting central banks, the framework that you operate under already includes concerns about growth and employment. What did you mean? How do you deal with your critics in this area? You know, um, the authors of our constitution were students of history and they had foresight. And so the clause in the constitution that talks about 
the central bank. It first creates the central bank. Says, um, the South African Reserve Bank shall be the central bank of the Republic of South Africa. And then spells out the mandate. And then expelling out of the mandate. It's very carefully crafted. It says the primary object of the South African Reserve Bank is to protect the value of the currency in the interest of balance and sustainable growth. They understood that there wasn't a trade-off between balance and sustainable growth on the one hand and inflation on the other, but that protecting the value of the currency is in the interest of balance and sustainable growth. And it was very important because it then said to us that price stability is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for balanced and sustainable growth. And so other institutions in the constitution get tasked with particular responsibilities, including the national treasury and so forth, uh, which is responsible for national financial uh, national financial matters. And so uh, it's a false dichotomy to then say that there is a trade of you either have growth or you have uh, inflation. The countries that have been booming for years have had low uh, inflation. Whether you looked at China or you looked at the advanced economies, those countries grew in an environment where they actually had low uh, inflation. That said, of course, there might be a short-term trade-off between uh, cyclical growth and dealing with, uh, uh, with inflation. And that is where monetary policy comes in, managing cyclical growth and against uh, the inflation, the, the price stability, stability uh, objective. And that is why the authors of our constitution didn't just say, is price stability in the interest of growth? It said price stability in the interest of balanced and sustainable growth, because it understood that over the long run, you cannot have that trade off. You might have a trade off in the short run. And that is why in monetary policy, we talk of a policy horizon. And that policy horizon, we are talking of a period of 12 to 18 months. That is where monetary policy uh, affects growth and it affects, uh, it affects cyclical growth, not the potential growth rate of the economy. But Governor, why should the poor care about inflation? And why, I believe after your appointment as governor, you went on a shopping street spree back in your village. How, how do you think about these issues? Well, uh, shopping spree is not quite what I will call uh, my shopping in that, uh, uh, in that village. To be clear, uh, I, I only had 380 rents to, uh, to spend. Uh, and there was a reason why it was 380 rents. If you take the South African bank loans, the 10 rents, the 20 rents, the 50 rents, the 100 rents, and the 200 rents, they make exactly 380 rents. And so I went back, I didn't just go to that shop. I literally went back to my father's house, parked the car there and walked from my father's house to the shop. And the reason I did it was that this was a trip I used to do every morning and sometimes would have to knock at the house of the shopkeeper to say, open, we actually uh, need bread. So I spent that 380 rents in that shop I bought a bag of mini meal, a bottle of cooking oil. Um, I bought bread. And, um, and so the message to the rural people in that village was to say to them, as a youngster walking through to this shop, I used to buy a loaf of bread for 10 cents. Today, a loaf of bread does not cost 10 cents, it costs 10 cents. And so I was basically saying that my job in protecting the value of the currency is to make sure that the basic foodstuff, the basic necessities, the prices of those necessities do not run beyond the affordability levels of the poor. The poor get affected by inflation more than anyone else. And when so, when I hear someone in a privileged position saying that inflation does not matter, we have got poverty, I say, 
but higher inflation can only suck the poor into even more uh, uh, poverty. And so those of us who are privileged enough to have assets, whether they are, if those assets are property or they are financial assets, we can protect ourselves against inflation. When inflation rises, property prices also rise. So the value of your property could be rising and so you do not have a problem, at the very least in nominal, uh, in nominal terms. And if you have got financial assets, uh, you can pick up stocks that have got an exposure to countries that have got lower uh, uh, inflation, or you could go and buy yourself government inflation linked bonds or even government nominal bonds because they reprice as inflation uh, goes higher. And by so doing, you will be protected against inflation. But if you are an ordinary working person, or if you are a uh, pensioner on a fixed pension or a recipient of a social grant, if you are a recipient of a social grant, you can't even negotiate your increase. Government says this is what government can afford. And if what government can afford is less than the inflation rate, the, buy, the buying power of that social grant actually diminishes. And if you are employed, you can negotiate with your employer for a salary increase uh, if you are lucky once a year. But if inflation during the year turns out to have been higher than what you thought it would be, you can go back to your employer and negotiate for a second or third a salary increase. You will have to wait for the next bout of salary uh, adjustment. So a central bank that maintains price stability and thus pursues a low inflation policy is acting in the best interest of working people, is acting in the best interest of those who are recipients of social grants and, and as such, protect the purchasing power of the currency, which is in the interest, in, in broader public interest. All of us end up benefiting because you have got an institution that is keeping inflation uh, in check. Mm -hmm. Let me come back to something Lori mentioned, which I believe you once said you would go to war to defend the independence of the central bank. Why does it matter so much? What is the role of independent institutions like the Saab in a democracy? Well, in a democracy, institutions matter. But quality institutions matter even more. We have seen institutions of our democracy significantly weakened, some of them totally gutted, and, um, and that does not serve democracy well. The Reserve Bank was not spared the attacks. We were also, we also came under attack. And um, when we came under attack, we decided to take a stance and say that this institution is a creature of the constitution. And as the governors of this institution, the governor and the deputy governors, we have been put in positions of authority and trust. South Africans expect nothing less from us. They expect us not just to protect the institution, they expect us to execute the mandate that they gave this institution. And so the constitution, which is a covenant that South Africans adhere to, has tasked the Reserve Bank with a particular responsibility of protecting the value of the currency. And as such, we had to step in. And of course, institutions can be created. And I do not want to pick up any particular one. But if you uh, cannot quite gut the institution, there is an easier way of doing it. You um, install at the leadership of that institution pliable individuals. And those pliable individuals will just do the job of destroying the institutions for you. But for central bank to be independent, there is a reason for it. And 
in the economic literature, we talk of the time inconsistency problem. And that time inconsistency problem says that um, what you have is that the publicly elected officials would like to promise the public low inflation. But when the time comes to take difficult decisions to deliver low inflation, they postpone uh, those decisions because why? There might just be an election uh, coming. Result of it is that the public then realized we were promised low inflation, but we ended up with higher inflation. And so the public then get into the habit that you are going to continue to have this higher inflation, it will not be uh, delivered. And so in the design of central banks, you then found that to deal with that time inconsistency problem, you assign the responsibility of tackling inflation to an institution that is independent of the political cycle. That is given that responsibility to make sure that price stability is uh, actually uh, delivered. But that cannot function unless you deal with the other aspect, which is what again in the economic literature, what we had called the principal agent problem. So in this case, you have assigned an independent institution. This institution, if it is independent, it doesn't follow that it will always act in public interest. And so you need a contract with society. The society is the principal here and the central bank is the agent of society. And that contract between the principal and the agent in the case of South Africa gets spelled out in the constitution of the Republic of South Africa that says agent, your task is to deliver price stability. And us as the principal, that is what we want from you. And that's what happens is that the flip side then went off, if you are now given this independence and you are the agent of society, the flip side of it is that you have got to be accountable to society on whether you are doing what society had tasked you with. And so central banks, you will find the world over, account to their parliaments. Uh, in South Africa, we took it further than just parliament, and broadened it to the public through our monetary policy forums and so forth. We go out there and publicly account. We, uh, every time we make a policy decision, we will communicate publicly and respond to questions. Just yesterday, we had a monetary policy forum where we tabled our, we uh, published our monetary policy review. It is part of the accountability uh, process uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the public. So you need independent institutions with a clear mandate, which have got a contract with society to deliver against that mandate, but those institutions must also be accountable to the, uh, to the public. So, is there one example of how state capture affected you that you could share with us? And secondly, is state capture over? Uh, I will not know uh, if, it <laughs> is, uh, if it is over. But when uh, it comes your way, you will know it has come your way. And so um, when it was coming our direction, we could see that uh, it was coming. And when we looked at it, we looked at it this way. Why steal petty cash? Why even go to uh, the tills or go to the safes in the national treasury if you could go to the reserve bank's printing press? True. That will be much better theft than dealing, stealing from, um, a, from a till or from the safes at the at the National Treasury. But the way in which it came 
it came in a very sophisticated uh, manner. Firstly, it came with something that said that um, bank licensing must be removed from the central bank and be located with the Minister of Finance. We were not consulted that that is what was intended to be done. For the South Africans who do not know, the office for banks used to be in the Department of Finance. It was precisely because it was not working in that space and it was located in the, that it was moved and got located into uh, into the, uh, 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 the Reserve Bank. And so the way in which state capture was coming into the Reserve Bank had to almost have to do with stripping the Reserve Bank of its, uh, of its uh, power uh, to, license, uh, to license banks. And if you do not have the power to license banks, you cannot have a financial stability mandate, which is the other part of our, uh, uh, of our mandate. You have got a financial uh, stability uh, 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 mandate. And so when we saw state capture coming our way, we shut the gates uh, of the Reserve Bank and said that we can see you are outside at the gate, but you are not getting in here because uh, this is the institution tasked with the responsibility of um, executing a constitutional, uh, a constitutional mandate. And so the attacks on the bank and uh, the law, they came in sophisticated, in sophisticated manner. Uh, you know, when there was a report which was subsequently set aside by the court that said that you must change the mandate of the Reserve Bank in this, we saw it as part of a systematic attack on institutions. And when we decided to file those papers in court, uh, we felt duty bound to protect the institutions of our democracy. And we felt that the one that we are running, being the South African Reserve Bank, have to be protected in this manner. Well, I think the society is very grateful for that. Um, let me move to South Africa's banks that you regulate. How did they deal with state capture in your view? Some people would argue that when they did close the Gupta accounts, they had acted rather late in the day and they should have done this much earlier. Is that fair? How do you see this? Well, that is an, would be an interesting proposition. Uh, there was a view that says that they acted too hastily and, um, but that is between the banks and their clients. Uh, the banks have got to onboard clients. They have got to do an assessment of the risks attendant uh, to that, uh, um, client. And the funny thing about the attack on the banks uh, at that time was that you basically had a government that was trying to act against banks which were implementing the laws of the same government. You know, um, the legislation against money laundering for a country like South Africa emanates from, an inter, from international standards set by the Financial Action Task Force of which South Africa is a member and an active participant. And so the principles in FATF got translated into our domestic law. And so the banks have to implement the laws of the land. And it was a weird conversation that a government that was expected to implement its own laws was accusing the banks of implementing the laws of, uh, uh, of the land. It was a weird conversation uh, to have at the time. So I'm often lectured by very senior politicians about competition in the banking sector and why there is so little competition and whatever I say, I'm never listened to, but what do you think? Do we have enough competition in the banking sector? And what role might a state bank play that isn't being played by our commercial banks? You must check the questions in the chat. Um, um, the, that would be an, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting uh, one. I do not think that, that, you know, the way in which we think about competition is that there must be 
a large number of buyers and a large number of sellers such that not, not one of them can influence the price on their own. But that's how, that's classically how we think uh, of competition. But the South African banking system is very competitive. Part of it has to do with the fact that we also have a very activist competition commission. But we have got a banking sector that is also very concentrated. But there is a history to this uh, concentration. Every time there is a banking crisis, there is a consolidation of institutions. And when you look back in history, um, I think that uh, there are basically, um, you could look at one or maybe two of the South African banks, which had been there since inception and just continued like that. For the many of them, they had had to take over other weak banks. And uh, in the case of one of the banking groups, it was actually an amalgamation of a number of banks to come together. And so that you, you then ended up uh, with, the, uh, with that concentration. If you are to have competition in the provision of financial services, you are going to have to have new entrants. But if you are going to have new entrants, they will find it really difficult taking on the, uh, the establishment because of the way things had evolved. And such, the competition in financial services comes from two interesting forces. The first one is from the fintech space, which are players who are using uh, technology to provide very niche uh, financial services. Mm. And whether it is in payment or whether it is in credit and so forth, and they take on the big players in that manner. But the big competitor for the banks, for me, that will come from, is, is from big tech. It's going to be your Amazon, your Apple, your Google. And that is where a real competition for the banks uh, is, uh, is going to be uh, coming from. And so <clears throat> you ask the question, what would the uh, role of a state bank uh, be? Well, I do not know what it would be, but I can tell you what the state's interest in financial services are uh, at the moment. The state owns a retail bank called the Post Bank. The state owns an infrastructure bank called the Development Bank of Southern Africa. The state owns an industrial bank called the Industrial Development Corporation. The state owns the asset, the largest asset manager on the African continent. It's called the Public Investment Corporation. The state is underwriter to the largest pension fund on the African continent. It's called the Government Employee Pension Fund. And I can add uh, the other public sector pension fund, then you get the picture. The South African financial inclusion show, figures show that we are at over 80% of people who are having uh, access to financial services in South Africa. So if a state bank comes in, I suppose it might end up playing in the 20% uh, or, 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 uh, or something. It's not clear what ill the state bank is trying to cure. But for us as a regulator, the state must then apply for a banking license like everybody else does. And if they meet the criteria, we will license it. And then they must go and operate that bank and compete with the rest of uh, the banks that we have in uh, the South African financial services space. And I can tell you now, um, you can ask uh, American or European banks that came into the South African financial services space that South African banks know how to compete. And I would like to see the state uh, play in that uh, space and compete uh, with uh, uh, the banks. And by the way, it will not just be South African banks. There are big international banks that are also now active 
uh, in South Africa. So our attitude in the central bank is that the state must uh, submit an application and we will license it. They, it will, that's such a bank will have to have adequate capital. It will have to have adequate liquidity like all the other institutions that are licensed by the central bank and then they will be licensed accordingly. Hmm. I see there are a lot of questions about reform. Don't worry, I am going to get there and spend some time on those kinds of issues with the governor. But let me turn to the situation that I hope South Africa doesn't get into, but our fiscal crisis is certainly very serious. So what happens, in your view, when a country runs out of money? With the notion of what's called modern, modern monetary theory has become quite popular, both overseas and in South Africa in certain circles. And essentially they argue that a country that issues its own currency and which can borrow money in its own currency can run very large deficits indefinitely, or at least until inflation begins to rise. What's your view? How relevant is mon modern monetary theory to South Africa today? Uh, you said popular. I'm not sure that uh, modern monetary theory is that popular. Populist it is, uh, but I do not think that it is, uh, it is that popular. Let's get back to the basics. <clears throat> you know that uh, when central banks were created initially, they were really initially a created to finance wars. The first central bank to be created was the Riks Bank uh, uh, in Sweden. The Bank of England was also uh, created for similar uh, purposes. Those was the first generation of central banks. The second generation of central banks like the Federal Reserve, which was created in 2013, the Reserve Bank in 1921, the generation that came afterwards were created in the main, because you wanted a central bank to deal with the rest of the other banks. That's in essence uh, what, had, uh, what had happened. There was a time when uh, money was not money, but money was gold. You had the gold standard. And you still had uh, central banks even then, but they were there was the gold standard. The entry of fiat money, which is money as we know it today, which is money that is just backed by the credibility of an, and standing of a central bank. That's, that's what uh, we have uh, today. And so proponents of modern monetary theory would say that, well, the central bank must just print the money, but it goes further. It basically says that the government does not need taxes. You do not need to be taxing because you must just print, uh, print the money. Now, this sounds a very attractive uh, uh, proposition, uh, so to say. But and if the solution was so simple, why do we still have poor countries? Why don't our countries just print money and problem solved? Uh, they do not have to do this. But even the largest economy in the world, the United States of America, ends up running deficit and having to borrow money from the capital market. And so does China, so does the UK, so does Germany, so does France and all of that. And interestingly, these are countries which are having reserve currencies. So when you say that we borrow in our own currency, we can just continue to print it, doesn't go. Because you see, at the moment, 20% of our domestic, no, about 30% of our domestic debt is held by foreigners. So we have got foreign debt denominated in our own currency. You want to make those investors to run. Say that you are going to solve the debt problems by getting the central bank uh, to print the money. It would not take long if you go that route that you will have inflation uh, running uh, ahead of you. And so, back to my uh, initial proposition when you asked me about central bank independence, and I said that you had to create an independent monetary authority 
to deal with that time inconsistency uh, uh, problem. I mean, um, I could imagine, I mean, could you imagine we are in the middle of an election now? No politician would have had to answer any questions about how are you going to finance this thing because you will just you will just print the money. Um, um, proponents of this year, this year has got to be just a particular rigor that is followed in uh, um, academic discourse in uh, uh, in economics, uh, and it has to be peer reviewed and all of that. And one would like to see that debate rage. Suffice to say that if something sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. Now, people with views like yours, probably people with views like mine, are often called fiscal conservatives. And we're in favor of austerity, is the charge. Um, they, they, they ask people in South Africa who say that austerity is unnecessary and that fiscal consolidation is unnecessary and that South Africa can afford much more public spending because we issue debt in our own currency. Are these people right, do you think? And what would be the consequences of abandoning fiscal consolidation and turning on the spending taps? Unfortunately, that is Eno you know, Godomana's problem as the Minister of, uh, uh, of Finance. Uh, he will have to be engaged in those uh, but let me tell you where the central bank comes in on this. And people talk of austerity. I do not, I do not know of a country that has got an austerity budget and had budgeted to have a deficit of 14%. That is what we had last year uh, until the commodity uh, price boom bailed us out. Uh, and I do not know if how that could even be described as austerity. But Minister Godongwana will have to deal with that uh, in just uh, less than 31 days time, he will have to deal with that. Uh, that is his uh, problem. Where does the central bank come in here? And, uh, and we can, you can rest assured that our monetary policy stance is not austere. Our monetary policy stance has been accommodative throughout from the time that we were hit by this shock, we had provided monetary policy accommodation to this economy within the context of our mandate, we had been able to support households and firms. The fiscal stance affects how much monetary accommodation we can continue mm. to provide. And the way in which they affect it is through two important channels. Firstly, is that when you looked at the figures in South Africa last year, you noticed that when the deficit was 14% of GDP, was projected to be 14% of GDP, the government was borrowing the entire savings of the nation. That meant there is nothing left for anyone to borrow to finance uh, investment. It was almost a typical crowding out effect that you were uh, going to see. But South Africa is a, uh, an open economy, so we continued to attract foreign savings. So there were capital flows that would still come in um, via the bond market uh, in the main. But when you have to attract foreign savings, that foreign savings must be priced. And when they price that, they assess what is the risk of investing in your country. And that comes through what is called the country risk premium, which is what South Africa pays above what the advanced economies are paying. Hmm. That country risk premium last year almost shot through the roof. It went above the equilibrium level. It has since come back close to equilibrium, but our country risk premium is still high. And when you look at the country risk premiums, why is our country risk premium still high? You then start to look elsewhere. And you say, we have got a very steep yield cap. Why is our yield cap steep? It is reflective of the fiscal matrix of the country. 
And so the fiscal stance affects the country risk premium and thus affects what we call the neutral real rate in South Africa. And so when fiscal doesn't consolidate, the general cost of borrowing in this economy rises. And as a result, firms struggle to uh, get investment going and, uh, and the lot because the hurdle rates are just simply uh, too high. Mm. And so, so we have an interest uh, in that and the chaps at the treasury understand this too well and I will leave them uh, to uh, build a case for a uh, fiscal consolidation. There is no doubt that uh, in the aftermath of what we have seen, we had to be rebuild our defenses. Um, uh, in 2008, eight nine, there was the global financial crisis. We entered that global financial crisis with ample fiscal space. Uh, we used that space to respond to the uh, global financial crisis, but never rebuilt our defenses. And so when we were hit by the coronavirus shock, we had zero fiscal space. And the burden of providing for a response ended up falling on the central banks. It was not just in South Africa, the world over, you ended up with that because very few countries had a fiscal space. And that's if you were in Europe, Germany had a lot of fiscal space that they could uh, deploy, but the others uh, didn't have. Right, right. Let me quickly ask you, picking up on the pandemic, what is your view on how the South African banks dealt with the pandemic? Um, do you think they responded well? Some people would say, one of the questions they're saying, how come the banks made such profits during the pandemic and lots of firms went out of business? On the other hand, a lot of banks have said that they lent a lot of money to their clients if they were asked for that. What do you think? Um, it's a very interesting idea. Before we get to the banks, let's get something clear. The South African corporates consolidated are sitting on a lot of cash. They went into a cash preservation mode as the coronavirus crisis hit. They still had cash getting in, but the cash balances had gone up in the aftermath of the shock when you look at uh, the totality uh, thereof. And at the moment, the bulk of that cash seems to be with the mining companies. And the reason is not hard to find, it has to do with uh, the commodity price uh, boom. But what does that tell us? If there is no investment taking place and corporates are sitting on uh, cash, you just have to go and look at the business confidence indicator and see that you have a problem. The uh, University of the Northwest releases a, uh, an, an index that they call a policy uncertainty index. If it is above 50, it means that there is a lot more uncertainty. If it is below 50, there is policy certainty. And it had shot above 50 and it been above 50 for some time now and it tells you about the policy uh, uncertainty. And uh, to, for as long as you have that, you'll have companies sitting on cash and not investing. But besides the policy uncertainty, there is the uncertainty with respect to the COVID shock itself. We do not know if this thing is behind us. If anything, it looks like we must learn how to live with it. And that means that risk models have got to be relooked so that you adjust your returns based on the risks associated with uh, this virus now being part, of, uh, being part of our lives. How did the banks respond to the show? When the coronavirus hit our show, our banks had not just ample liquidity, they also had capital buffers. We said to the banks, we will allow you to dip into your buffers. So in other words, we relaxed the capital requirements and said that you will be able to 
uh, dig below those buffers because we are aware that you are going to have to support households and firms. We will allow to dip into your liquidity buffers because we are aware you're going to have to support household and firms. We said that in terms of the accounting standards, if it was nine, you are going to have to be doing provisions. We provided guidance that said that if the clients had been of good standing, uh, you do not have to provide for this, allow the clients to adjust. The total amount of support that the banks offered in this manner last year was as much as circa 800 billion rand. That was the relief that the banks uh, provided. And I know that a lot of focus had been on the loan guarantee scheme. The loan guarantee scheme compared to what the banks were offering to their clients was shock and cheese. And so the banks responded in that manner because they were provided with regulatory relief and they were able to do that. And from us as the central bank, we said, quid pro quo. We are providing you with this capital relief, but you shall not declare dividends to you shall not pay bonuses. And once they were able to come out of that and they said, we do not need the capital relief anymore, they were able to start providing for um, dividends and for bonuses. And when you looked back, you would have seen that a lot of South Africans in the low to middle income earning category moved from rental housing and started purchasing their own houses. And then you will see that the kind of relief that was provided was starting to find itself into the real economic activity. Governor, we've got about 10 minutes left and I want to talk about something you've been talking about for quite a while. You've talked a lot over a few years now that South Africa, if we want growth, we have to talk about trade-offs and that often we think they're easy options, that if we take the easy option, that will get us the growth and jobs that we need, but we never do. Uh, so can you talk to me about how you see this? You've made some very strong statements about this. Um, can you expand and explain how you, your concerns and why you are making these strong statements about reform in South Africa? You know, economics is about trade-offs. And when you are governing, you have the right to choose. To govern is to choose. And so when there are trade-offs, you must understand that there would be losers and winners in the short term, in the long-term society is the beneficiary. And so when we think of these trade-offs, we must think of these trade-offs in the now between this player and this player, but we have also to think of it intertemporally. What do I mean thinking about it intertemporally? What do we, when we make choices, as a society, we cannot allow the excesses and the desires of this generation to be at the expense of generations that come after us. So what has been happening is generation of today makes choices that uh, all sound like it is for now, it benefits us now, and leave the generation behind us with a massive debt burden. And so we call that intergenerational inequity. Because if we were making decisions that are intergenerationally equitable, we would understand that intergenerational trade of that the decisions we make today will impact the generations of tomorrow. 
but they are also the trade-offs of the now of consumers versus producers, of producers versus workers, and where you strike the balances in between. There are trade-offs like those, and if you are a, a, a monetary authority like us, the trade-offs are about trading, dealing with what I have called cyclical growth and inflation in the short term, and making sure that the decisions that you make do not have an impact on the long-term price stability mandate of a central bank. If you are a fiscal authority, the decisions you make might end up being, do I spend money on consumption expenditure today or do I spend it on infrastructure? So if you end up borrowing because you are investing in infrastructure, the generation that comes might look back and say, okay, the generation before us borrowed, but what have they left us? This is what they have left us. If you have borrowed to finance consumption, it's a different ball game. You have consumed and the generations that come after us have got nothing to see for that. And so our tasks as technocrats, as economists, is to help frame those trade-offs so that the political leadership of the country can make decisions. And they got to understand that there is no free lunch. There is no free lunch and that the only, there are only difficult decisions to be made. And what we can do as policymakers is to give an impression to society that society can have everything it needs and wants. When we know that the resources to meet the needs and wants of society are limited. As it stands, um, uh, the number of taxpayers in this country has shrunk. The number of people who earn above a threshold of 750,000 has shrunk. And so as you make commitments, understand that that is what uh, you face. We would be taking so much in taxes out of uh, this economy, but we can also only borrow so much. And we might think we can go and borrow overseas, but even the people overseas can only lend us this much. So we must stop giving an impression to society that there are no constraints to the decisions that we are uh, making. And then when I talked about society making trade-offs, that is what I talk about. And those trade-offs are trade-offs that have got to be made by government. It's got to be made by people who are elected. Us as technocrats, we can frame those uh, trade-offs and say, these are the trade-offs you must make. You are governing, to govern is to choose. You must make those choices. Well, Governor, I'm going to end on that note. South Africa has to make some serious choices. Thank you very much. This has been a fascinating hour and we really appreciate you giving us the time and the role that you're playing in South Africa over the last decade and today. So thank you very much and more, well, more power to your arm. This, this conversation is over everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much, Governor. Cheers. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> ah. I think we're still online with everybody. Um, no, it's. Uh, yeah, we are not. We are not disclosing any state secrets. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's true. No secrets to disclose. So. Uh,